Welcome to the National Press Club. My name is John Hughes. I'm an editor for Bloomberg First Word. That's Bloomberg's breaking news desk here in Washington. And I am the president of the National Press Club. Our speaker today is Baltimore Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake. As the president of the US Conference of Mayors, she will discuss that group's agenda for the 2016 presidential candidates. But first, I want to introduce our distinguished head table. This includes club members as well as guests of the speaker. From the audience's right, Jared Rizzi, White House correspondent for Sirius XM. Wesley Lowry, national reporter for the Washington Post. Erica Sutherland, assistant professor at the School of Communications at Howard University. J.P. Grant, president of Grant Capital Management. Skipping over our next guest for just a moment, Kevin Johnson, mayor of Sacramento and former member of NBA's Phoenix Suns. Donna Linewan Leger, breaking news editor for USA Today. She's a past president of the National Press Club and she is the vice chair of the club's speakers committee. Skipping over our speaker for a moment, Jonathan Salant. He's the Washington correspondent for NJ Advance Media, the Star Ledger. He's a former National Press Club president, and he's the member of the National Press Club Speakers Committee who organized today's event. Thank you, Jonathan. Calliope Parthemos, Chief of Staff for the Mayor of Baltimore. Bruce Johnson, anchor reporter at WUSA TV. Chris Chambers, Professor of Media Studies at Georgetown University. And John Doman, a reporter at WNEW-FM and the coach of the National Press Club softball team. <laughs> I also want to welcome our C-SPAN and our public radio audiences. You can follow the action on Twitter Use the hashtag NPC Live. That's NPC Live. 35 years ago today, a telephone call was made from Yankton, South Dakota to the National Press Club, and history was made. In a small room upstairs here at the club, C SPAN created the first regularly scheduled national TV call-in show, a tradition that continues today with the Washington Journal program. The Press Club today is placing a permanent recognition of that call, that historic call, on the wall outside of that small room upstairs where the call was made. So future generations will always know that part of history at the National Press Club. The man who took that phone call that day? Well, he's Brian Lamb, the founder of C-SPAN. Brian is a broadcast legend. He is a journalist. Journalist. He's the past recipient of our highest honor, the Fourth Estate Award. And he's a personal hero of mine, and I know so many others here. At the National Press Club, we simply love Brian Lamb. Brian, could you stand and be recognized? Our speaker, who we are also honored to have here today, Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake, was thrust into the news earlier this year in a way that she wished would have never happened. In April, an unarmed black man, Freddie Gray, died in police custody. This set off a series of urban disturbances in Baltimore. At least 34 people were arrested, six police officers were injured, and Maryland Governor Larry Hogan called out the National Guard. The Small Business Administration estimated that about 285 businesses were damaged at a cost of $9 million. Mayor Rawlings Blake was forced to cope not only with the riots and their aftermath, but the underlying problems that led to the disruption. 
Elected at age 25 to the Baltimore City Council, she was the youngest person ever to ascend to that position. She later was council president before being sworn in as Baltimore's 49th mayor in 2010. She announced in September that she will not run for re-election. She said, quote, it was a very difficult decision, but I knew I needed to spend time focused on the city's future, not my own. Mayor Rawlings Blake is here today in her other capacity as president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. She will talk about the mayor's urban agenda, the issues they want the 2016 presidential candidates to discuss. Let's give a warm National Press Club welcome to Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. And while you've uh, given, I think, a very uh, thorough and thoughtful introduction of the head table, I think one of the, the thing that I would like you to know about KJ is that he's not just a former basketball player, but also a former president of the US Conference of Mayors. And I'm very grateful that you are here. I appreciated his leadership for many reasons, not the least of which is now I can be Mayor SRB since he was Mayor KJ. <laughs> I figure if I say it enough time, it'll stick like KJ sticks. Just a few more years. Either that or I'll have to learn how to dunk, one of those things. So I wanna thank the National Press Club for giving me an opportunity to join you today to talk about a few things, uh, both my role of, as mayor of the city of Baltimore as well as my, as my role of president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. I will do my best to cover both of those areas as well as give us some time for questions at the end. And depending on what I see coming in as questions, that'll be <laughs> determination of how long I go. So it, as I was listening to my introduction, it, be, it reminded me that so much of the country's uh, current view of Baltimore have been shaped by a few things. And we know that we'd had the challenge of being shaped by the, the excellent writing and act, acting in the HBO series, The Wire. Uh, but we've also been shaped by the, the two weeks in April uh, following the death of Freddie Gray and the subsequent demonstrations and unrest. And the tragic death of uh, Freddie Gray, um, you know, it's, uh-oh, do we have a, a phone that's on? Um, you know, it, the, the, the challenges uh, of that tragedy are complex uh, because we know that it's, it is a tragedy. The, the loss of any life anywhere uh, to violence in our streets is, is uh, distressing, uh, and it is distressing for Baltimore on many levels. Uh, it was traumatic for residents, for police officers, uh, for business owners, and it is traumatic for the, uh, the industries in Baltimore that depend on the image of our city, because Baltimore is much more than what was shown on the endless loops on some of our national media. Truth be told, uh, while in my introduction it was uh, suggested that I was forced to confront these issues uh, that emerged uh, subsequent to Freddie Gray's death, none of those issues were new to me, nor was my work on those issues. I've been working on the issue of police community relations since I've been mayor and well before uh, as a city council person uh, all of those years ago. Uh, I introduced legislation to address the issue of racial profiling in Baltimore City. And what, when I became mayor, uh, the issue of police community relations, police brutality, I knew was front and center as a part of the work that I had to do as mayor of the city of Baltimore. I was very, very pleased in 2011 to be able to reduce the homicides to the lowest number they'd been in generations, uh, more than 40 years. 
However, that same year when I was traveling from community association to community association to talk about the progress that we've made, uh, getting under 200 when I was growing up was, uh, would have been, uh, to talk about it would have been laughable. You know, the thought that Baltimore could get under uh, 200 homicides. So when we achieved that goal, I was very, very uh, proud. But when I talked to uh, residents during that time, what I, uh, what I learned through those conversations was as pleased as people were about the progress with homicides, they were equally frustrated with the treatment that they were receiving uh, by the police, by the activity that they were seeing from the police. That's why when I became mayor, I dismantled the unit that was responsible for much of the abuse and the mistreatment of Baltimore City residents. I held public safety forums across the city throughout, this, uh, throughout my time as mayor and particularly around in the summer of 2014 to hear from residents about these issues as we work to reform the police department. And that's why I launched the Body Camera Task Force, because I knew that it was important to fight for more accountability, more accountability on the ground, as well as more accountability in the policies surrounding the police department. And that's why I went to Annapolis to fight for changes in the state law on the Law Enforcement Officers' Bill of Rights. Uh, it was a lonely fight in January. Uh, as I tried to convince legislators that, uh, that we were living in a powder keg, that we had to deal with the issues that many people in our community felt that there was an uneven playing field, that police officers in our city, in our state, were held to a different standard uh, after they'd been found guilty of a crime, and that we had to start the process of reforming our police department across the board. I, I'm very encouraged now that after Freddie Gray's death, many have come to realize uh, the, uh, the wisdom of that argument, and they are now willing to be a part of that solution. Uh, I just think about what would have happened if that fight, if those reforms could have started uh, in January when uh, during the session I was fighting for those reforms. And I knew uh, that the reforms needed to happen, like I said, within the department and within the way that we connected with communities. And that's why I invited the Department of Justice program, COPS program into Baltimore for a collaborative review. I heard very loud and clear from communities that they wanted to be viewed as partners and not perpetrators, and I knew that we needed help to get there. And I asked for the Department of Justice COPS office to come in to help us evaluate our uh, community, community policing efforts, to help us uh, guide, create a, a pathway forward to stronger relationships. Yes, we were seeing progress in reducing crime, but we had a long way to go when it comes to uh, bettering the relationship between the community and the police. So despite the progress that we made, it was clear that the, the community was still on edge with respect to police relations. And in retrospect, what happened around the tragic death of Freddie Gray serves a reminder to cities across the country uh, about what can happen in their cities. When I've spoken to mayors across the country, virtually all of them have this sobering sense that what happened in Baltimore could have happened in their city as well. The unrest in Baltimore served as a reminder of so many things, and it was clear uh, to us, as well as we uh, believe we prepared for those things, the, the, uh, the, the unrest and our response uh, was a stark reminder that uh, Baltimore was not as prepared as we should have been and certainly could have been for, those, uh, for, for the unrest. And we're making significant improvements when it comes to communication, when it comes to training and equipment. I don't think anyone uh, would have expected uh, the unrest to unfold in the way that it did, but what it did give us was an opportunity to strengthen our response, to strengthen our training, and to be better prepared. And I'm pleased to say that I've seen uh, a lot of improvement in the way that we've handled the uh, potential unrest that, is, uh, that has happened since. And I haven't waited for the after action uh, reports. While I'm grateful for those, the, the work, the, the independent evaluations of the uh, incident, I haven't waited for those reports to be finished uh, before making changes. We're making changes uh, as soon as we saw those problems uh, come up. We made sure that, uh, I made sure that the police department was led by someone that eliminated distractions away from our crime fight. Our new police commissioner has taken a number of steps to ensure that we are better prepared 
for uh, what could be six challenging uh, and separate uh, criminal trials coming forward. We're working with the Department of Justice on a patterns and practice investigation. I think I'm the only mayor in the country that's actually asked the Attorney General to come in to do a patterns and practice investigation, which will likely result in recommendations for even broader reforms. We've improved communications, training, and equipment already. So the unrest in Baltimore create that was created in Baltimore and the aftermath uh, points to deeper underlying issues, issues of lack of jobs, challenges with housing, education, and disparities in opportunity. The crime surge in Baltimore and cities across our country right now, this spring and this summer, illustrates that as well. And if we are to succeed in preventing future unrest, we must attack these underlying issues. None of this was created overnight, and it won't be solved overnight. Whether it's the, the uh, breach in the relationship between the community or the, and the police, whether it is abandoned housing, when you have years of neglect, when you have years of abandonment, we know that the, 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 the fix will take years as well. To make progress, we need all of the support of our partners to participate, the not-for-profit partners, private, the private sector, the state and federal government. The Obama administration has really stepped up for Baltimore, and I know that it wants to step up for other cities as well. And this speaks to what all of us at the U.S. Conference of Mayors are hoping we will see from the 2016 presidential campaign a substantive conversation among candidates that recognizes the issues facing our cities and speaks to real solutions. This past week, more than two dozen mayors of cities, big and small, gathered in Baltimore to discuss both our priorities as well as our strategies moving forward to ensure that those who wish to lead our federal government fully understand that cities are the engines of our national economy and are at the center of every major issue that we currently face in public life. We know that there are so many great economic and cultural things happening in our cities of all, of all sizes all over our country. We know that the strength of our cities and their metro areas help to bring the national economy back from the recession. And we also know that if we are going to continue to grow and be more successful as a country, cities have to be at the center of the solution. We know that there are far too many people who have been left out of the, great, of the recovery uh, since the Great Recession. They lack opportunity. Far too many Americans in cities, large and small, continue to fear for their safety. They feel disconnected from the broader community. This is something that I'm especially aware of in Baltimore, but it's something that affects and concerns mayors, all of the mayors that convened last weekend. And as we confront challenges like these, our partnership with the federal government is threatened by the dysfunction in Washington that no serious candidate for president or Congress can or should allow to continue. Gridlock strangles Washington, and the consequences of that gridlock, they're passed on to cities. That's passed on to mayors. That gridlock is strangling the future of our country. Major campaigns like this one come along once every four years and mayors are uniquely positioned to influence the national dialogue. And as mayors, we have a very large bully pul pulpit. And we can get our message out to great portions of constituencies throughout the country. We know that people are frustrated thus far that this campaign has not been wholly focused on issues that matter most to working families and people who live in our cities where the majority of people in this country live. We have to have a campaign that's focused on substance and things that can move our cities and our country forward. So we came together this past weekend to define our priorities, which will be carried forward to the candidates over the next 13 months. We will publish these priorities in a new document, the Mayor's Compact for a Better America, a 2016 call to action. And while the exact wording of the document is still being finalized based on intense conversation, that's code for, what is that code for? Intense conversation, I won't say argument. <laughs> 
intense or robust conversations that we had this past weekend. But we are reaching consensus on many of the critical areas that we want to see a part of the national campaign, a part of the national conversation, investing in our infrastructure, our roads, our bridges, our rail, investing in our water and sewer systems, focusing on educating and training the 21st century competitive workforce, strengthening the federal and local partnership on homeland security and public safety, and reforming our broken immigration system. We're going to focus on expanding clean energy use to grow our economy, to protect our climate and, and our environment. We're going to fo focus on investing in community development and affordable housing, encouraging pathways for access to entrepreneurship, technology, and innovation in our cities improving access to health care, particularly mental health care, redirecting tax policy to promote investment in cities, advancing middle class growth, and reducing income equality, increasing the economic strength of metro economies through promotion of trades and exports, and the attraction of international tourism. I realize that these are broad ideas, but underneath each one of these ideas, lie the future of our country. And as we work through the final wording on all of these issues, I know that there won't be total consensus. While we have a great track record of working across the aisle in the uh, US Conference of Mayors, even all the Democrats don't agree on everything and the Republicans don't agree on everything. So we know that there won't be uh, total consensus, but what you will see is Mayor speaking in a unified voice about what's important to our country. I know that we can find Democrat, Democratic mayors who are willing to take these issues to the Democratic candidates for president, and that Republican mayors will be willing to address these issues with the Republican candidates. And there'll be issues that we'll work on together, regardless of who gets elected as president or whatever the makeup of the next Congress will be. Because there's one thing, that we have a track record of, and that's working together. We are a bipartisan group of mayors who know how to put ideology aside to focus on things that matter most to American families because our jobs demand results. We can't have ideolo ideological conversations about how we're gonna fix potholes or collect trash. People just want it done. They don't want to know how we feel about it. Mayors have to get things done. We believe Washington could learn something from us. And as we define our federal priorities, we also know that mayors have never been the type to wait for others to help. Mayors around the country have created and implemented best practices on each of these issues that we're putting forth in our compact. We're not asking any of the candidates to do, some, to do anything that we're not willing to do ourselves. We must continue to share in innovations with each other and with our broader community so that we can maximize our impact with or without federal support. I want to thank you again for giving me the opportunity to join all of you today. I want to thank all of my Baltimore, uh, my, my Baltimore contingency. I was, um, we wanted to make sure I had a nice, friendly audience down here in D.C. <laughs> so I'm very pleased to have so many friends from Baltimore who have traveled with me. I look forward to answering what I've already seen are going to be some very thoughtful and interesting questions, whether they're about Baltimore, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, or even my role as Secretary of the DNC. I'm looking forward to hearing from your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mayor. As you suggest, many great questions have, have come in. This questioner asks, in an era when congressional Republicans won't even fund crumbling roads in their hometowns, how do you expect any support for an urban, read, democratic agenda? I, I think it's a mistake to read urban and, and democratic as uh, synonymous. 
we have many uh, mayors across this country, Republican mayors, that are fighting for those same infrastructure dollars. You know, Republican roads are crumbling just like Democratic roads, and we need a, we need a solution. I, I, I think when, and, and again, this is why this election is so important, when we let the debate be around what somebody's face looks like, or you know, you know whether somebody has a low energy or whatever. You know, whatever. I don't want to use a bad word, but you know that that kind of stuff. It misses the mark because we have uh, families that are hurting, and when you talk about wanting to to push our economy forward and create jobs, when you're fixing a bridge in Baltimore, you can't export those jobs to China. That's work that happens in Baltimore. When you're, when you're fixing roads, when you're fixing uh, rails in Philadelphia, that work has to stay there. So we need our, the, the Republican Congress to understand that they're not being patriotic when they're holding up uh, these, pro these projects from moving forward. When they refuse to fund infrastructure investment, they're refusing to support America and uh, the people that they've pledged to serve. You mentioned a hope for a substantive debate on poverty and crime issues from the 2016 presidential campaign. What have you heard so far that heartens you? What have you heard so far that's disappointed you most? So I'll put my, I'll take off my uh, nonpartisan conference of mayors hat and put on my very partisan secretary of the DNC hat. The one thing I can say about our, the, the debates that I've seen uh, from uh, the, the Democratic candidates or the conversations, it's been about real things that matter uh, to families, whether it's the fight to improve, uh, in, increase minimum wage, or whether it's the, the, our efforts to make sure that more Americans have access to quality health care. These are the things that matter to people at home. These are the things that connect. These are the things that uh, will hopefully uh, re-engage a population that I think is getting uh, growing in their frustration around what they're seeing at the national level when it comes to politics. I'm, I, I would be very, very um, embarrassed if you know, someone who had no uh, concept of uh, our country and what we stand for and, and uh, politics uh, had only one opportunity to get a sense of what we stand for when it comes to uh, campaigning, and that was the Republican debates on TV. If that was someone's only uh, you know, that, that they only had that experience to, to judge our country, I would be embarrassed. I think we're, we're better than that, uh, and we should uh, hold all of our national leaders to be better than that. Uh, there are too many things that are important to uh, families that aren't getting addressed, and, you know, it, we're having personality conflicts at a time where our country can afford to have that the least. This questioner notes that mayors often focus on local solutions to big problems, but what issues require national solutions? Can gun control and police reform be responsibly conducted in a national patchwork? So that just in the question, when you talk about gun control and, and a patchwork approach, I mean, the, 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 the question answered itself. You can't have a patchwork approach to um, gun control um, Right now, uh, not too far from here, mayors from across the country are meeting with the Department of Justice. Police chiefs are meeting uh, to talk about the uh, surge in violence that we've seen across the country uh, this summer. And the mayors are speaking with, with one voice about what's needed, and that's better uh, support from our federal, um, our uh, criminal justice partners. You know, we need to, uh, do whatever we can to get guns out of the hands of people who have no respect for their lives or the lives of uh, you know, other members of the community. Uh, we need to do more to uh, strengthen the, the, the laws and the enforcement when it comes to um, people with suffering from mental illness, um, having access to guns. Those are the conversations that we're having because in, in our cities, we're, we, you know, People are dying every single day uh, while the NRA and, and Congress has debates. People are dying. And we know that uh, we can't wait on um, the lobbyists to uh, miss a meeting or to, you know, to, to not make a phone call. We have to get stuff done. And we're, we're looking for 
uh, the Department of Justice and uh, our federal uh, law enforcement partners to step up and to fill that gap uh, until we can uh, get some common sense uh, gun reform in our country. What can mayors do to combat the rising homicide rate that's happening in so many cities across the country and including Baltimore and, and here in Washington, D.C. as well? What can be done to stem it? So in Baltimore, we've, uh, we had a very, very rough uh, July. Uh, August was better than uh, July. September was better than August, but we've still, we're still suffering from a very high rates of uh, violent crime. One of the things that we've seen uh, work and why I keep talking about federal, the partnership with federal uh, law enforcement is our work embedding uh, federal agents in the police department, increasing the partnership between the U.S. Attorney's Office, our state's attorney's office, uh, as well as uh, the, the Baltimore City Police Department. We, we're talking right now, the conversation is happening about uh, what happens when ATF uh, agents are embedded in crime labs and, and have the ability to, to give almost in real time uh, data around guns that are used on the streets. This used to take upwards of six months to get the information back, and if you're a mayor, that's useless. You might as well never tell me uh, where the gun is coming from if you're gonna tell me six months from now. So anything we can do to strengthen that communication, to better share uh, data and information, it will help us to be more nimble and to be more responsive uh, to crime, and I think that th that partnership has been responsible for the, um, the improvements that we've seen over the summer, but there's still a long way to go. What are the one or two things you would put at the top of the list in terms of what other mayors in the nation should learn from your experience following Freddie Gray's death? In other words, what, what are the one or two things you would cite to them as, as uh, things to do to prepare to be ready? Oh, to prepare to be ready. Uh, I, I would say that uh, what mayors are learning, not just looking at what happened in Baltimore, but the unrest, the riots that we've seen in other places, is that the protests and the, the riots of today are, are substantially different uh, than what happened in the 60s. And in those ways that they're different, uh, we need to prepare differently. And, um, you know, I've been pleased that we've had the, the I mean, the lessons learned uh, help prepare not just Bal Baltimore's police department, but police departments throughout the country that understand that the, the tactics are different and um, you know, the, the strategies for how we deal with them are, are different. So um, our after action work, I think, will be helpful uh, as we move forward, as I mentioned, with the six trials of the officers that are coming up. But also, they're helpful t in other cities. I mean, the mayors across the country have watched the work that I've done pushing for uh, reform in the police department. Mayors across the country have watched me fight for a level play, a, a more level uh, playing field, holding officers that are that have been uh, accused or uh, found guilty of wrongdoing accountable. Uh, they've watched the work that we've done trying to repair the breach between the community and the police, and they've also seen, in spite of all of those efforts, we still. Uh, had riots. We still had the unrest and the protests. So they're taking what happened in Baltimore uh, very seriously. So the, t the, uh, the lessons would be, um, you know, to take a look at um, that what we've done subsequent to the unrest with the improved um, training, the better communication protocols, as well as equipment, um, and uh, to understand that it's never enough. The, the work to, uh, to, to build relationship it's never over. It's not something that you can say, okay, I had a forum, you know, that I went to a community meeting, uh, you're done. It's constant relationship building work. I say all the time in community association meetings that the police and the community are married. It can be a healthy marriage or it can be a bad marriage, but we're in this together. There's no way that the community can uh, do it alone, and there's certainly no way that the police can do it alone. We're, we, for better or worse, we're, we are stuck together, and it's up to us to decide if we're going to have a healthy relationship or we are going to al allow uh, us to have an a, a unhealthy relationship 
You know, I know plenty of people married for, you know, 30 years, haven't spoken in 20. You know, it's, it's, it can happen, right? But it, and it happens day after day of just not talking. It happens day after day of not attending to the relationship. So when I, when we have these, uh, when, we, when I have public safety forums, it's me working to attend to that relationship. One of my colleagues in government says, you don't ask the doctor if the medicine is working, you ask the patient. We have to stay in communication. Sometimes it's, you know, it's stuff you want to hear, sometimes it's not, but you have to deal with all of it because we cannot uh, think that the relationship is going to get better on its own. It's going to get better because we, you know, the police make the, 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 the decision to be in this relationship, uh, repairing work, and the community. And that's why the partnership with the Department of Justice is so uh, powerful for me, because they get it. They've done it before. They've worked communities through these types of problems. And I'm encouraged uh, by what I'm seeing, and I'm, I'm encouraged that, you know, over these next uh, you know, I think 13, 14 months of my term, you know, that, that we are going to get some significant progress. The Department of Justice announced that it will begin keeping more statistics on those killed by police. How important is transparency regarding police killings to developing positive relationships that you're talking about between the police and the communities? I think it's important to have the transparency around police killing, but also around police interaction, which is why I've been working very hard in Baltimore to make sure that we implement a police body camera, a body-worn camera program that works and something that the community can have faith in. Um, yeah, I'm, I want us to attend to those issues around privacy, what happens when a police officer goes into the house of someone who's called because of domestic violence issue. You know, do you turn the camera off? Do you not turn the camera off? What happens to that woman if she is uh, victimized again? Because once it's filmed, it's part of the public record. You know, those types of issues uh, we have to, to grapple with in order to get it right. How do we um, maintain the, uh, the, 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 not the film, but you know, the, the, the video? How do, who has access to it and all of those things? So I think by making sure that we get this right, We'll have uh, the transparency around, yes, around uh, in custody deaths or police involved shootings, but also around the day to day interaction of the police with the community, which I think will be helpful. This questioner says the police commissioner said he was stunned by the level of poverty in Baltimore and in part attributed that to crime. Why hasn't more been done to address poverty? in Baltimore, what, what can be done at the city level? Yeah, poverty is a problem that exists in Baltimore and, and, and cities around this country. It is not just a, a not even an American problem, it's a global problem. Uh, I don't know of a city that solved the issue of poverty. Of uh, and whilst many work to eradicate the disparities in income, you know, sh sh raise your hand if you know the city that's fixed this problem. Uh, it is a uh, an intractable problem that I think if you're looking, if 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 a a cure to it is success, we're never going to be successful. Uh, but I think the work that we're doing every single day to improve our, our schools. Um, you know, I'm standing here next to one of the biggest av the advocates in the, in the country for uh, excellence in education. When we provide excellence in education, we're creating pathways out of poverty. My dad grew up in the projects, and he made it very, very clear to us growing up that education was his key out of, uh, out of poverty, and he wanted us to understand that education would be our key to whatever we wanted to do in life. Um, you know, I had a, uh, my dad was an elected official, my mom was a pediatrician, um, you know, we had access to a whole lot, but um, I said if George Ash made encyclopedias, we would have had them, but they weren't spending money on stuff that didn't, wasn't going to help our education, you know, we, there was no designer jeans, there was no, you know, unless our grandparents got them, designer tennis shoes, they wanted us focused on our education, we had the same little black and white TV, I know you know I'm talking about old school with the turn it with the, with the pliers, you know, because <laughs> that their resources were going to making sure that that their children were educated, right? And um, so education is a key. 
um, focused on creating jobs. That's why it, it frustrates me so when we've, cre we've made the, the infrastructure investment a, uh, a partisan issue. Those are jobs that could help bring people out of poverty today if those resources were put there. So, I mean, I think that, you know, the, that the work to eradicate poverty is ongoing work. It's work that I think will continue to the, to the end of our, our time. Um, I think that there's a, there's a way to continue to make progress, and I'm uh, pleased to say that there are many mayors that are doing a lot of good work making progress on this very, very challenging uh, issue. Is it perfect? No. Uh, but we, we have uh, mayors, including the work that I've done in Baltimore, um, that are fighting for progress every day. Mentioned in the introduction that you have said you're not running for re-election, mm -hmm. and that's you've got a full, more than a full year in office yet. How has your announcement affected your ability to work in the city? Has it helped or hindered? Sometimes lame duck uh, uh, is limiting. But other times, uh, as John Boehner is showing, he, he seems to feel a little freed up. So how, how is your announcement affecting your work uh, going forward? Uh, I, I'll say that, you know, I'm very focused on the work at hand and, um, you know, fighting for progress every single day. Uh, while I've uh, made it clear I'm not seeking re-election, I've also made it clear to everyone that uh, works with me and for me that that doesn't mean that we're on vacation. That means that there's a lot of serious work that needs to be done. And I think Boehner, Obama, you can, you know, go down the history of people who have uh, been where I am uh, and see that they're, they're great examples of uh, leaders uh, in the running up to the end of their term who have been unfiltered, you know, unchained, unrestricted, um, I think for me, the, I have the benefit of uh, every single thing I do not being viewed through the lens of uh, campaigning or politics. Uh, and I have the, the freedom of being able to um, be more, uh, I think, um, intentional when I'm talking about those things as well, when I see that politics is standing in the way of progress. So um, I am determined uh, that these, uh, these, this more than a year that I have left on my term will be made in every single day uh, pushing for progress for Baltimore's families. And I have no doubt that we're going to continue to, to make progress. This questioner wants you to put on your DNC hat. And they wonder, should there be more sanctioned debates? Why or why not? It's, it's interesting for me what things kind of get traction and what, uh, what uh, don't. This notion of more debates or not, um, you know, I'm, I won't really weigh in on that except to say that uh, we have the same number of debates uh, this time as we did the last time we had a contested Democratic primary. Um, so then it leads me to the, qu the question, and it was not a, there wasn't an issue last time. The number of debates was seen to be um, you know, fully satisfactory. There wasn't this, you know, push to have more than the question then comes, what's different this time? Is it that we have uh, some candidates that have, you know, that, that um, have a lot of resources and, you know, that are, um, you know, that are, that are, you know, highly ranked in the polls and some that aren't? You know, what are those, what are those issues that, are, that created this debate, um, this debate controversy? So, you know, I know that the, uh, our chair, uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, is working with the leadership of um, the DNC to look at that issue. And I'm sure um, that if there's a consensus that we need more debates, I'm sure that that will happen. Uh, I'm just, I, I still have this question of, uh, you know, why uh, it seems when you have the, you know, a contested primary and a contested primary, why this time, you know, the number of debates that we have is, is seen as insufficient. Can you tell us who you're supporting or uh, in your DNC job, do you have to wait until there's a nominee? How does that work? So the officers of the DNC have, uh, you know, we have this neutrality provision that we can't participate in the, uh, in the presidential primary. Uh, so I get to uh, ignore that question. <laughs> Here's a question at the intersection of presidential politics and local issues. 
Are you concerned that any of the presidential candidates may try to limit, it, limit or eliminate the municipal bond tax exemption? What case are you making to the candidates or to Congress to preserve the exemption? Yeah. Like, that's one of the things, like, when I talk about infrastructure investment, I try not to get too upset about it because it just, it really frustrates me. That issue really frustrates me as well. You know, I, I, I don't know who's telling anybody that we should be balancing the budget on the backs of uh, American cities. Who's telling anybody that it makes sense to restrict the, uh, the capacity of cities to make significant investments? It just doesn't make sense. So uh, we have a group of mayors that have taken on this, uh, this campaign and uh, we will continue to be aggressive in um, making sure that the municipal bonds are protected. This is a little early, I acknowledge, with a full year left. But the questioner says, what is your biggest regret as mayor? And what would you say is your biggest accomplishment? Mm. Biggest regret? I don't know. I, I always feel like um, there's always going to be opportunity to have a bigger regret than any of I've had <laughs> to date. Um, I will say, um, I don't. I, I can say the, the thing that one of the things that I felt the most proud about is the, the work that that we've done when it comes to school construction and fighting for more than a billion dollars uh, to come to Baltimore. Uh, Baltimore has the oldest uh, schools school facilities in the state, and when I toured uh, our schools, it was embarrassing and it was. You know, to, to see you know, some of the, the, the classrooms with the ceiling tiles coming down, the windows were fogged. You know, you know that kids are um, cold when they should be hot and hot when they should be cold. Uh, you can't drink from the water fountains. You know, I, would, I always would joke that, you know, the boys' bathrooms you wouldn't even send your mother-in-law into except for somebody told my mother-in-law, so. <laughs> but no, it was, you know, just, it, it was deplorable. Deplorable. So when we were able to uh, bring that level of investment, I don't know of another city in the country that has that level of investment going on in, in the uh, in capital improvements, building new schools. When when the governor uh, signed that piece of legislation, there was a sense of calm that I had that I didn't, I wasn't expecting, and that calm came from the fact that I knew that if you know, God, it was God's will that I died that day, that I was a part of something that would transform my city in positive ways for generations to come. So I said, as, as far as biggest accomplishments, I'm really, really uh, grateful to have been mayor at a time that we could do something huge like that, that I know that, you know, far after I'm gone, we'll still um, have changed the trajectory of Baltimore's future. And of course, uh, this is a question along those same lines. You've got a year left, but how do you see yourself being involved publicly after you're done being mayor of Baltimore? What kind of work do you see yourself uh, getting involved in? Um, you know, I, I guess I should be thinking about that more because I get that question every single day. Um, but I have so much that we're doing uh, in the city. I mean, I'm sitting here looking at my team from housing. Um, you know, we're rocking when it comes to our blight elimination. You know, to, this is an issue that many cities don't even attempt because the, the, the problem of blight and vacant housing has piled up for so long. Um, many have, not, have, have given up because the challenge is so big and uh, a, a local foundation just um, took a look at our blight elimination plan, which is called Vacants to Value, which is having our five-year anniversary next month. You're welcome to come to Baltimore November 18th and 19th for a nice summit. Uh, but when they looked at it, they said it's the most comprehensive blight elimination plan that the city has seen in more than 40 years. Yeah, that's big stuff. 
and to be able to to continue that work every single day to transform neighborhoods. You know, when I when I've noticed this uh, since uh, the death of Freddie Gray, and, and the nation the nation's eyes have been fixed on Baltimore and some of Baltimore's neighborhoods and the challenges. And you you hear from people, oh my God, it's it this um, you know there's so much abandoned property and there's so much you know there's so much neglect. Absolutely, and it didn't get that way overnight. This we've been you know. Community, like the, the frustrations that we've seen in the communities, because we've been living with this for decades. The difference is now there's hope that something better is coming, because we've had fits and starts of blight elimination plans that didn't give hope that there was real change coming. But with vacants to value, we've seen our efforts, our market-driven efforts, transform neighborhoods. And when you can do that, when you can look in the face of someone who has uh, is looking at green space instead of uh, trees coming up through vacant properties and see the the fact that they it's like they say that we know that you see us and that better is possible and better is coming that's the kind of stuff that is going to you know that that I'm going to focus on for these, uh, and I'm glad I got a head nod from my housing team that I'm going to focus on because you know it. It is in important work to bring hope uh, to our communities, and we do that when we focus on making sure that government does what it's supposed to do for the citizens that we serve. This is a question in many respects that pulls together everything we've been talking about for the last hour. This questioner says, "Some would argue." that without the unrest and protest experienced in places like Ferguson and Baltimore, none of these issues that you mention would be even on the table for discussion. How would you suggest that citizens who feel their interests are ignored get their concerns on the national agenda? I think that might be true at a national level, but those issues, the issues of police brutality, they weren't new to me. Um, we've been able to drive down the number of uh, excessive force complaints. We've been able to drive down discourtesy complaints uh, and, and lawsuits that have been brought against the city because we've been focused on um, improving the, uh, the culture at the police department and confronting that culture uh, in the police department. So locally, um, while I think the, the nation's eye has been uh, turned to Baltimore in the um, wake of the Freddie Gray, uh, the death of Freddie Gray, this is something that is not new to me. You know, I think people are acting brand new about it now that they're, you know, that, that some people feel that they're, you know, jumping on the bandwagon now. You know, like I said, when I was in, uh, in Annapolis fighting for reform for the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, you know, I think it's great now that they want to have uh, committee hearings and task force and all that. Would have been lovely if they would have done that in January when we could have then shown the, the public that we were unwilling, that we were willing to confront the, the uh, police lobby, the police union, and, and fight for progress and reform uh, to, to uh, hold officers ac uh, accountable. So um, nationally, I think uh, in many places, these areas, the, 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 whether it's Freddie Gray or uh, Eric Gardner, Michael Brown, these issues are um, creating opportunities for dialogue in many places nationally that might not have had those conversations, but this has been an ongoing conversation and ongoing work uh, that we've been doing in Baltimore, and it didn't start um, with the death of Freddie Gray. Mentioned the police union. There's a couple questions specifically about the police union. Considering the reaction of the police union based upon the charges into the Freddie Gray case, how does the city government work long term to gain the rank and the cooperation of the rank and file. I think you're talking about two different um, things. The, the rank and file and the police union are, are two different entities. I think the the rank and file officers. You know, we have officers that very, very proudly serve uh, the people of Baltimore. The vast majority of the officers that we have in our city serve our serve our residents with uh, with distinction and respect the oath that they took in the uniform uh, that, they, um, that they wear. The challenge I have with police unions is that they are um, unwilling to evolve um, 
you know, to, to yeah, when I was in Annapolis fighting for reform for the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, I, I remember having t conversation with the leadership in the union. And I said, listen, we might not get this passed this year, might not be next year, but it's coming. Change is coming. If you can't see it, you're blind. There's a, there is a wave in our country that is, uh, that, will, that is unrelenting, that will hold officers more accountable uh, for wrongdoing. And I said that, and I, I remember this conversation like it was yesterday. I said that you are uniquely positioned. I said you can be the first in the nation to be a part of crafting what that looks like. But you can do the same thing that you all have done for decades in the past, which is to just say no, to block any type of progress, and see where that gets you. And I would say that, uh, you know, I, I think that the action of our uh, police union and many across the country has, has made them, um, has, has really devalued the power of that, uh, that that union, I don't know of, uh, based on the the, um, the rhetoric that they've been spewing in Baltimore, who would want the endorsement of the FOP? And they did that to themselves uh, by the way that they've chosen to deal with the charges and the police, the way that they've chosen to deal with our efforts to reform, uh, all of those things. And it didn't have to be that way. Uh, they. They had with me a partner that was willing to, uh, to work with them to address these issues. I was very open in trying to find solutions, um, but you can't just go back to um, those kind of knee-jerk, um, the, the entrenched behaviors and think that it's gonna work in uh, 2015. We are almost out of time, but before I ask the mayor the final question or questions, I have some housekeeping. The National Press Club is the world's leading professional organization for journalists. We fight for a free press worldwide. To learn more about the club, go to our website, that's press.org. And to donate to our nonprofit journalism institute, visit press.org slash institute. I'd like to remind you about some upcoming speakers. This Friday, October 9th, GOP presidential candidate and neurosurgeon, Dr. Ben Carson, will address the National Press Club luncheon. On Thursday, October 15th, at our annual Fourth Estate Awards Gala, the National Press Club will honor Gwen Eiffel, moderator and managing editor of Washington Week and co-anchor and managing editor of PBS NewsHour. And on Friday, October 23rd, Oscar-winning director and actor Kevin Costner will be here to discuss his new book. I'd now like to present our guest with the traditional National Press Club mug. Thank you. So the last uh, few questions in the time we, we have remaining. Can the Ravens, now one and three, turn it around? Ooh. Yeah, I'm a, a huge Ravens fan, uh, so much so that I've realized that I've blocked one of those losses out, and I have had arguments with people, no, we're not one in three, it's one in two. They were like, no, and they go, I was like, no! You know, I'm like, I have repressed a whole game uh, because I cannot uh, allow myself to think that we have started this season uh, one, uh, one in three. Uh, we, I, we have to turn it around. There's no other option. I cannot envision a world in where the Ravens don't make the postseason. So we, we have to turn it around. We have someone at the head table who's quite interested in books, interviews, authors, uh, frequently, in fact. Question, what is your favorite book? So I don't have a favorite movie or a favorite book. I will say that I have a favorite author and uh, that's James Baldwin. Uh, I remember, um, and, and I go back to his books often just because of the way that he wrote. It really s speaks, it really spoke to me, and I can remember 
uh, when he came to Baltimore to speak to students at a local college, I squeezed my way in just for the opportunity to hear him speak. And it was one of the things that I'll, I, I hope uh, that I will never uh, forget in my life because he had a sensitivity and a way with language that is unparalleled in American literature. As far as useful books, um, I've read, um, I mean, I say you, you know what I mean, not <laughs> books that, uh, you know, that, that aren't for just in, enjoyment, the enjoyment of literature. There's a book that I keep on uh, in my office, and I think it's by Alan Deutschman. It's called Change or Die. And it's a book about the you know, what it takes to change an individual, what it change, what it takes to change an organization, and I've been um, it's been something that has intrigued me about um, individuals' unwillingness to change, even if it's in their self-interest, as well as organizations. Um, so that's something that uh, a, a book that I go back to a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, how about a round of applause for our speaker? Thank you. I would also like to thank the National Press Club staff and its Journalism Institute and Broadcast Center for organizing today's event. If you would like a copy of today's program or to learn more about the club, go to our website, press.org. Thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>